timeline, but don't okay. quote me on that because I'm no expert. See if it's going live right now on my page. I'll see. Okay, we are we are live on Facebook. And I'm wondering if anybody can see us or hear us. So let me see here. I'm lying, but oh here we don't go. Call. Anybody can see us or hear us. Oh yeah, we're live. We are, yeah. But oh here we don't go. Call. Anybody can see us or hear us. Oh yeah, we're live. Perfect. So you can see us, Anna. I it might take a minute. Facebook is weird. I'm just saying. Like I'm, I'm always working. Lives. Oh, my client just said yay. Okay. Great. My client just Great. said, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. For okay. Now we can get started for letting us know. Now are we okay? All right. Okay. So as soon as I play this, I'm gonna also, I think we're let me see if we're still live here. Oh yeah, we're still live. Okay, we're probably still talking live and um, I'm working out my technical glitches. <laughs> That's always, That's all right. always right. Always just, um, awesome. All right, so let me do, yep, yeah, we're live, definitely live. And remind me that I have to make sure I turn off the live. All right, so here we go. I'm gonna record this to the cloud. Okay. All right, I'm gonna put it are, yeah. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh, are you pretty? Okay, so I hope everybody can hear us. Just give us a thumbs up. Um, people are gonna be coming in and out uh, today. So uh, Katerina, if you can hear us, can you just give me a thumbs up? Okay, let's see. I think I might have to. Uh, Katerina, if you can hear us, can you just give me a thumbs up? Okay, she's giving me a thumbs up. Thank you, Katerina. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Let's see, I think I might have to. All right. Katerina, if you can hear us, can you just give me a thumbs up? Okay, she's giving me a thumbs up. Thank you, Katerina. <laughs> Okay. Perfect. Let's see, I think I might have to. All right. Um, I mean, if you can hear us, can you just give me a thumbs up? Okay, she's giving me a thumbs up. Thank you, Katerina. <laughs> it, it keeps replaying, which is interesting. Um, Katerina, can you hear us now? I think there is a, a little bit of a delay. It's doing something a little strange. I think often if you you can't watch yourself do a live because it will do that. I don't know. That's so I'm wondering if we should go. I can still hear you and see you. Great. She can still hear us and see us. I'm just not playing it. Thank you so much, Katerina. Okay. All right. So we know uh welcome, welcome. We're finally figured out our tech glitches. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Um, you got behind the scenes uh, information. <laughs> All right. So welcome. I'm so glad you're here. You could be many other places and you're joining us and there's going to be people in and out. Many of you watch this after, but it's really special being live because then you can type in the chat and Anna and I can in real time speak with you, which is really fun. So I welcome you to the emotional compatibility, the cosmic connection, and we're going to delve into the depths of emotional compatibility with your partner through the lens of astrology. We're also going to uncover the mysteries of your chart, what your charts reveal about your emotional needs and your partners. And then we're going to take three steps, or I'm going to share three steps with you to amplify your emotional connection and let in more love and connection. So... Go ahead, Anna, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself so people know who you are, and then I'll go and introduce myself. Sounds great. 
I was, I, and I'm going to be totally transparent here. I was going to go off of what I had written down and that's okay. My, and um, my uh, computer has frozen. So <laughs> I have no access to anything right now. Um, sorry. So it's just derailing me a little bit, but um, I can introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> you could totally do that. That might be better. All right. So Anna has been in the in the holistic field for many, many years. She's been using many holistic modalities, Ayurvedic, health coaching, energy medicine, mind, body, alchemy, Taoism, and astrology in her workshops and retreats, classes, private practice for almost three decades, 30 years. That's a long time committed to guiding others on their personal paths towards positive evolution. She's the co-founder, excuse me, co-author of the best-selling book, Turning Points. She's the creator of Reveal Your Radiance Code and the contributor to the Holistic Fashionista magazine. And she's very grateful to have worked with many celebrities and change makers at Post Ranch Inn and internationally uh, and internationally. And in her off time, you can find her hiking, dancing, and enjoying the ocean and feeding her addiction to the local farmer's market. And Anna lives in California. So abundance of farmer's markets out there. So great. Yeah. And I'm Danielle. Uh, some of you may or may not know me. And I'm a certified relationship and couples coach. And I've dedicated to transforming conflict into connection and guiding couples to navigate challenges and cultivate profound love and help them to rewrite, rewrite their love story uh, together and build a future filled with understanding and respect and unwavering connection. So if you have any questions along the way, please write them in the comments. Um, and we will get back to them. Uh, Anna, do you want to just take the questions at the end, do you think? We'll take them at the end and not in real time? Yeah, I think that's the that's the best, uh, especially given that it it lends us to a little less multitasking sometimes. Perfect. Um, Perfect. So yeah, and uh, thank you for introducing me. That gave me the chance to unfreeze my computer. And get I'm there. glad you told us. Or me. Uh, rolling. <laughs> it's okay. It happens um, to all of us. And I'm glad that your computer is back and working. Thank you, Katarina, for updating that everything is sounding really good right now and clear. Perfect. Um, well, I, I do just want to say, um, you know, I'm really happy to be here. Welcome to everybody, you know, who's meeting me for the first time. Uh, or if you happen to be on here and do know me, hello, <laughs> and say hello, definitely, definitely engage. We welcome that. We do want to answer your questions. We do want to make this robust and, you know, fun. Definitely fun. And uh, I really like to have fun. Um, thank you, Anna. And um, if you want to just jot down in the, cha uh, the chat where you're from, because there's people coming in and out on this chat, as well as from all over the world. So just jot down where you're from and we'd love to hear you. Okay, so let's dive into the depths of emotional connection with your partner through the lens of astrology. And I'm gonna hand this over to Anna for this part and uh, let's do it. Yeah, so um, I, I, I feel like this is like the meatiest topic. Um, for, for what we're talking about today and what, or what we're going to be talking about in this whole series, honestly, is this emotional connection. And, you know, something that I look at from the lens of astrology is that each person has an energy pattern that's expressed by the blend of all of the signs in each planet and the placements that they have. And then when we are looking at a couple or any kind of relational uh, type of astrology, we're now looking at how do these two energy patterns dance? How do they interact with each other? How do they engage with each other? And there can be um, sometimes a greater fluidity and there can sometimes be almost like where the energies aren't feeding each, each other as well or feeding each other in different ways. And so that's we're going to be looking at 
something um, that I see is really critical, both in understanding for your own energy pattern, but for sure when it comes to intimate relationships, which is your moon. Now, if you have access, and I'll actually, real quick, I'm just going to actually tell you how you can run your own birth chart. Now, you likely, if you don't, if you're sort of new to astrology, you're not going to be able to interpret it. However, if you run your own birth chart, A, if we ever, you and I ever end up working together, um, you know, you've already done that. You can send it to me. We can look at it. Um, but there is a key at the bottom that will tell you your moon is in such and such. So you'll know, you'll at least know that you'll know, um, the sign that it's in and maybe even the house, if you can decode that, which isn't terribly difficult. Um, but it's at least, a, it's at least a starting point. Um, so you can go to astro.com. You can run, you just click on the extended charts. You're going to have to create, a. um, it takes you two minutes to create a free account. And then you click on the extended charts tab, and then you just input your data and then it will give you a chart. Um, again, there'll be a lot of glyphs and symbols on it. Likely you'll be like, what is this? But there is a little key at the bottom that says sun in such and such, moon in such and such, and you'll see that. Uh, so that's the quick tutorial. So we're talking about the moon and the moon is your emotions. It is, it is your mood. It is like literally think about the moon itself. The moon which we know changes phase, right? We know the full moon, we know the new moon, we know, and then there's the crescent moon and then there's the quarter moon and, you know, there's the balsamic moon. There's all these different phases. Of the the balsamic moon. moon? I've never heard of the balsamic moon. The balsamic moon is an interesting phase right before the new moon. So it's, and there are sort of, there are different energies that are associated with this. So there's moods. There's all these moods that it goes through and it changes sign. And this is just in the greater scope. This is not even in your chart. That's not what I'm talking about in your chart. Your chart is your chart. It's your blueprint. But but our moon, so to say, changes sign about every two and a half days. So it is a very, um, I actually really love to follow where the moon is because it does change so often and because it is so related to the emotional tone and to the mood and, and can kind of, signal like maybe what's going on and we can start paying attention to that but of course here in the scope of what we're talking about we're talking about more specifically your birth moon where your moon where the the moon was when you were born which is what that chart I just told you how to run and this indicates who you are emotionally who you are, what are the feminine, these are the feminine energies expressed. Now this goes for masculine and feminine, um, you know, bodies um, that is still the more feminine energy, the more receptive energy. This is how you give and lo receive love on a deeper level. This is what you need on a deeper level, emotionally, what, what, how you nurture and how you may feel nurtured. It is going to be about your emotional motivation. Do you, if you feel, mm -hmm. if there's, and it's also how you get triggered, how you, um, how you might react uh, emotionally. And I want to be specific about that because there is another placement that's more about reactivity and, and kind of aggression. But this is, this is like the the un or the conditioned responses and reactions that you may have on from your emotional self and it deals um with emotional safety how do you feel emotionally safe and that is a lot about that also i think the emotional motivation if you don't feel safe that motivation to move into the realm of emotions is not even going to be there mm. um so it, ha it, it can also have to do with the home space and the home space is certainly your home, but it's also your emotional home. Where do you feel at home? And this can deal with sharing space, sharing the home with your intimate partner. 
if you're in that situation, I know not everybody is there, but, but that's where, what, how does, what's the energy of that need to be for each of you as individuals? And then the energetic combination of that, like I said, how the energies feed off of each other. It, it relates to the mother, um, to how you felt mother, to your connection with your mother, but even just the mothering figure, even if you're like, well, I lost my mother when I was four months old, or, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of uh, situations, but still that connection with the mother and something to really integrate, I think here is I feel that part of the emotional healing through the lens of astrology is like looking at what the energies of your individual moon are, how they may relate to any healing that needs to happen through the mother line. This is like a little bit 2.0, but I'm going down a rabbit hole apparently. So that, and, and, and even if you're a female and you're a mother, how do those mothering energies get expressed in you? Um, and these are all important in our intimate relationship, how we give and receive love on a deeper level, how we feel nurtured, how we don't feel nurtured, what we need on a deeper level, the conditioned responses, and how do we become aware of those conditioned responses? This is the subconscious mind too. Sub, and I would, I would say the subconscious emotions, because there is a distinction between obviously emotions and the mind, although depending on where your moon is, like me, I have my moon in an air sign. I may get into my head about my emotions because air relates more to the mental energies. Hmm. So I may think my emotions as opposed to someone like Danielle, who has her moon in an earth sign. She's, she, she may feel them more in her physicality. She may experience them more in her physicality and by doing as opposed to thinking. Um, yeah, but, uh, Marina also posted, she's in a Capricorn, which I'm as well in a moon Capricorn. Okay. Um, so she's got her moon in Capricorn. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, I think this tie to what that is, and, and like I said, so subconscious mind, emo, subcon or subconscious emotions, really, um, the memories, the fears, dreams, these are all related to our emotional nature. And the more that we bring them into our consciousness, and that's what astrology does. It's like, oh, we can have awareness about these energies. How are these energies flowing through us? And it, and, and I'll, you know, I, it's, it's really, I said this last time where attention goes, energy flows. So once we have awareness, if they're, if they're unconscious or subconscious or conditioned, then we're not always like, pre we're just kind of in that default pattern as opposed to more of the conscious pattern. And that's what we can start to do using astrology with ourselves and then with each other. Um, it really helps to bring about the unconscious to the conscious is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Be and that's the first step in in evolving and growing and healing and, and deepening intimacy at right. I mean, yeah, you know, that we have to, we have to be aware of ourselves as well as our partners in order to do that. If we're not, then we're just operating on some kind of autopilot and intimacy, you know, that deepening of the relationship with ourself and others is not going to happen. Do you, so with the compatibility, you said, you, like, I, I know that we had talked offline, but about this emotional compatibility with our partners and being able to see some of the obstacles that will be coming up. And that mm -hmm. is based off of the moons, correct? And the, mm -hmm. and depending on what your partner's moon is in and what your moon is in will help to bring awareness around some of the obstacles that you may come up against or the challenges and also the opportunities for growth with that sign. And we'll get into emotional safety later from the relational standpoint, 
um, of coaching, but do you want to speak? Uh, cause I find that fascinating. Um, yeah, I have to, and I'm, and I can speak both from experiences I've had with clients yeah. as well as myself, which is when, when I've brought forward again for myself in my relationships and also with clients, when these energies have been brought forward, it's like, oh, oh, I, and, and, you know, you kind of, you may have this revelation about yourself and then you're like, yeah, that is, you know, I said, just, I'll use myself as an, as an example uh, that I said that, you know, I tend to maybe think process. I try to think them through sometimes a little too much, but in having that awareness, I can catch myself. Am I, am I actually letting myself feel my emotions and allowing myself to be tender? Or am I trying to like process intellectually, which is distancing me from what I'm actually feeling? Sometimes that distance is good, you know, a certain level of distance, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's too much detachment. Um, but also air moves quickly. Air will just, you know, I mean, there's not a lot of density for it to move through. So, so I may process things fairly quickly, um, depending on what it is, as opposed to an earth, an earth moon can be a little slower. There's density there. There's, mm -hmm. there's something that has to be moved through and felt and sometimes time needs to be taken like, and there might even be, you know, some stubbornness in there. Um, I can understand that actually on a, in my own chart with you mentioning, um, and, and like I said, Marina and feel free, if you do know your moon, shoot it in the, in the chat, but, uh, as a Capricorn moon, I, it does take me a longer time and more density. I feel that right. Um, and so that's very interesting when we're talking about partnerships, because if it takes a partner a little longer to process something because his moon or her moon is in an earth sign versus if your moon's in an air sign, it might just move through you much quicker and you may be able to get to that understanding or that emotional understanding much faster. So it, it does also allow for some, uh, a level of, um, tolerance and understanding compassion and compassion. When we know these things from an astrological standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 100%. And you know, this isn't black and white. I'm, uh, so there's a lot of nuance and we have fixed signs. We have mutable signs. We have, you know, cardinal signs. So that adds another layer of nuance to it, but, and of course where it's placed and, you know, some of the other energies. And I will say too, um, well, I want to say a couple, couple more things here, which is what another one is that your moon can relate to how do you need to take care of yourself emotionally, regularly, meaning this is like yourself, this is part of your regular self care to keep yourself. I, I hesitate to use the word balanced, but I'm going to use it to keep yourself a little more regulated, to keep yourself a little more balanced. And if you're not attending to this, you're going to feel way more out of balance, way more emotionally out of whack and volatile or unstable or whatever your word is, um, or even depressed or moody or, you know, all of these things are going to be, um, they're going to be indicators. You're not doing your self care. Um, you're not doing your emotional self care, which is related to your mood. And that's when, if both people can have some awareness around that, it's great. And even each other, at, you know, having that permission between yourselves to be like, you know, like, are you t are you taking care of yourself? You know, and sort of like have that dialogue inside of the relationship. That may not happen in every relationship, but um, but certainly if it can be opened up, that's really powerful. Right. And, and, and in a way that's non-judgmental, like your partner doesn't feel like criticized. Like, are you doing well, your, 
Are you doing your work? Are you are you doing your self regulation slash self care work, right? But more so, oh, I'm just noticing. Like, do you need some time out, honey, or do you need to go take a bath or whatever it is? Go have a run. We had talked about that, you and I, Danielle. Yes. Go out for a run. Like something just happened. Your partner needs to go for a run. They have maybe they're in a fire sign. You know, you're ready to talk about it. They're not. So again, that compassion, once you sort of understand. Beautiful, beautiful. And I noticed um, Katerina put down, she thinks she's that she's in a Libra. So Libra is also an air sign, air sign. Yeah. As, as a moon. Yep. Um, yeah. So like peace, domestic peace, I find with Libra moon. And sometimes they'll go a little overboard with that of like trying to people please too much just to keep domestic peace. So for the Libra, it's like, I got to maybe assert what are my needs and wants. And sometimes that takes a little digging around to figure it out. Yeah. So they so want that harmonious. And I would love to hear if that feels true for you. Um, if, yeah. you if you want to uh, put it in the chat, uh, Katerina, if that feels true for you and or Marina as well. Mm -hmm. um, Thanks for being so active in the chat. It's great to yeah, yeah. have you with us. Yeah. Um, and then in regards to what if our moons are incompatible, you know, not compatible, like what, what happens then? Like say, yeah, we're, and I'm a, like you said, like you're an air and I'm a, a, a earth. Like they're yeah. very different. Yep. Their emotional com compatibilities. And actually, Danielle, our energy exchange moon to moon is a little tricky. Like mm -hmm. our emotional energy exchange with earth and air is can be a little sticky. However, this is where there's cross compatibility. And hopefully like people's brains can wrap themselves around it. But, 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 a, a, but, a, but with the moon in particular, this cross compatibility is especially powerful when your moon, like what? Okay. So if your sun and then their moon are cross compatible because the sun, because the moon reflects the light of the sun and then conversely. So I've seen this a lot in, in couple situations and actually when um, like Danielle, if you and I look at this, my son is in Pisces. I know you also have a Pisces son. So right there we have from an egoic kind of self identity, there's, there's um, like level playing field, but your moon, which is in an earth sign and my son in a, in a water sign, those are cross compatible so, um, water and earth. Mm -hmm. So that's where there can be this cross compatibility that ends up happening. And um, yeah, so that's that, not just dependent upon the moon being in cap in, in uh, incompatible, but there's other compatibilities in the actual yeah. astrological chart. Yeah, there's the there's what's called the cross compatibility. And, and I think especially with the moon, it can come into play in this sun moon cross compatibility because of that reflective you know the sun being the masculine the moon being the feminine they're kind of like the yin and yang that and that reflective that that dancing together like the yin and yang symbol um that lends itself especially well to to mm -hmm. that if we're looking at it through the lens of astrology it's very interesting. You know, Anna and I were talking the other day and Anna works with both therapists and coaches and vice versa. So, you know, it, it, it and, and therapists and coaches like this is adjunct to the work because it really gives us a perspective on which to view from a pulled out non-attached position because we can't really change our chart. Right. And so it just is what it is, but we're able to have it as another lens to look at relationship and dynamics that unfold and how to possibly start to look at our relationships in a different way that can help yes. 
accelerate our healing and the healing of a relationship. And it's a, it's objective. Like you said, it's like a, you know, it's objective. And so, um, and you can't change your chart, but you can work with the energies. You can, do I want to work with these? I mean, it's just like any energy it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really fascinating because there's so much you can work with just in your birth chart. There are lots of different kinds of charts you can do, but just in the birth chart, there's so much evolution and growth and information. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. And I love how you say it. And we do have some notes in the chat that I'll just, before we, you know, continue, I just want to drop in. Yeah, there is so, and I love how you describe it. These are energies that are flowing through our charts. Mm -hmm. These are energies that then collide as the separate entity of our relationship. And how do we work with those? Yeah. So, um, so, uh, so Katarina had talked about Libra and in the home, you remember you had mentioned the home and <laughs> the piece. And she said that, uh, I would not identify as necessarily a people pleaser. Although looking back, I used to be one more in my early twenties. Yep. Yep. And, you know, and that's where sometimes we come into, we we're on our path and we start to realize similar to you, uh, sorry, it was Katarina or Marina that said that. It was uh, Marina is a Capricorn. Okay. Oh, so Katarina is the Libra. She is the Libra. Okay. So she's the Libra moon. So Katarina, so yeah. When I got an Aquarius, her son is an Aquarius. She mentioned. Got here. it. Okay. Um, yeah. And I can relate to that because when I was younger too, I would go into the detachment, the cold detached emotional realm. But it was like a protective mechanism. But I didn't, I wasn't fully aware of it until a friend pointed it out, a very dear friend. And and so, oh, oh my gosh, I just had this illumination. This was before I really had dove into astrology in any real fashion. And and then as I dove into astrology, I, I saw how that was due to my moon. But yes, we can we can evolve and that's what I mean. We can evolve and grow. We don't, it's not like I'm always gonna be a cold, yeah. detached, you know. It, <laughs> right. It provides, we are talking about that awareness, that awareness, and then gives us choices, which we'll talk about later in emotional safety is when we can stop mm -hmm. and pause, we have choices in those moments. And yeah. so I feel like this gives us an opportunity to stop and pause from the astrological state standpoint. And then we have choices that we can make based on, we don't have to live and die that these challenges and our, or obstacles with our charts and our, these energies with our partner are the end game. It may just be the beginning of how to navigate these energies. Great. And, uh, and Katarina has questions later about her seventh house and relationships. So yeah, you go ahead, uh, Katarina, and we will uh, take those questions at the end. So just, you can go ahead and jot it down. Thanks for letting us know. And Marina's son is in Pisces. Um, or her son or her moon? Her Marina says, my son is in Pisces and my partner's son is in Virgo. Okay, so you're opposites as far as the ego. So that's the sun as opposed to what we're talking about right now, which is the moon. Um, so I'd be curious to know what that is because, you know, the egoic self, the self-identity, it's it comes into play for sure. Um, and those are considered sort of harmonious, but they're also opposite. So there's a, there's this, you know, growth and learning, um, like an earth school that happens with that. Ah, so um, they, are you saying that they are actually, um, growing and learning like together, there's energies will lead to more growing and learning. Is that what you're saying? Or if if you can embrace each other because literally they're on opposite sides of the wheel so it's like pisces is here virgo is here you know i'm just whatever it doesn't can be anywhere but uh, yeah they're on opposite sides of the wheel and so you know whereas virgo is practical pisces is like dreaming dreamer you know virgo's like what are the details Pis pisces is like i'm just feeling into the energy <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just feeling into it. <laughs> I don't have right. to 
I find Virgo energy very analytic, like very analyzing yeah. and like organizing and researching and yeah, practical, streamlined, detail oriented, you know, um, both very sensitive in different ways. I can see that. I can see that just my experience of mm -hmm. Virgo, uh, not necessarily as a son, but in general. Right. Uh, also some feedback. Love it, Anna. Thank you. I love to understand our energies from the astrological side and know how to use them. Thank you for this information. So I just passing. Thank you, Katerina, for your gratitude and uh, sharing that. Thank you. Um, all right. Any last words, Anna, before we shift gears a little bit? Um, no, uh, no, I think, yeah, I think that was the meat of what I wanted to share today. I love it. And we're, and each week, by the way, everybody, we're going to go deeper in different avenues of astrology and love astrology, as well as relationship coaching, all based around this five part series, the month of love. All right. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was so fun, Anna. Um, so let's go ahead now and talk a little bit about the three steps to really amplify your emotional connection and let in more love and connection. So I want to invite you to think about the following and maybe Anna will jump in here uh, with me. And I want you to think about what makes you feel emotionally connected to your partner. You can jot it in the chat if you're watching this. Um, even live or after the fact, because many people are at work during this time. So they'll write in later on, but on it, like for you, what makes you feel emotionally connected to your partner and everybody else can jot it in the chat. Yeah. I, I have to say it has to do with a certain level of, <laughs> which is so interesting. Cause I'm, I think astrology, right. I like my brain goes there. Yeah. But I don't want, I want to like know their mind. Like, and I know that sounds funny. There's, but, but to, to feel that level of emotional connection does somewhat happen for me through the mind of like, wow, they think uniquely, they think differently about the world. And then it's like almost like the, the key to my, to then me opening up more from the emotional perspective, which is interesting. Interesting. So that's like really perspective, like wanting to gain more perspective mm -hmm. on how they think about the world and perceive the world makes you feel more emotionally connected to your mm -hmm. partner. That's really interesting. Very cool. All right. What makes you feel more loved? We often, um, it's hard when we don't know what makes us feel loved, not saying this is your case, I'm just talking in general. So when we are able to really identify uh, what makes us feel loved, then we're able to express that to our partner and give us partner an opportunity to meet and helping us to feel loved. Now there's the love languages, that's one <laughs> avenue, um, but what makes you feel loved? There's many ways that which we can feel or experience love. I mean, I think, and this probably relates a bit to the love language, which is I really feel that they make time for me and that, that, mm -hmm. and even from the perspective of that, I'm aware that the part of them making time for me is that they're thinking about me. That, I mean, that's still allotting time. The quality time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Oh, well, you're, you're a woman of my own heart because. I too, like is quality time uh, supersedes anything for me. Like mm -hmm. when I had taken the test, it actually was the highest. And then everything else was secondary. Um, beautiful. And what makes you feel emotionally safe? Truly it is when I know that they will tell me the truth always. Mm. And that includes the things that they think might hurt me. But ultimately, where I feel the unsafest is when I feel there's something withheld. Ooh, right. Withholding information from our partners is 
definitely a way to create a lack of safety in the, in the relationship. So that honoring that of honesty and, and not withholding in the relationship. Beautiful, beautifully said. So when we're talking about emotionally, emotion, emotional safety, everybody, we're talking about basically, um, our ability to feel safe, not just on how we think about feeling safe, but actually how our bodies on a biological level feel safe. And so emotional safety is essentially uh, necessary for emotional connection. So we talk a lot about currently, and I don't know if you've come across this, Anna, but like going deeper with emo- uh, with with connection, But in order to go deeper, I like, I feel like that's a buzzword, like, like, let's go deeper with connection, right? Like deeper connection, deeper connection. A lot of things I come across is about deeper connection. Mm -hmm. It's not, I use it as, it's a buzzword and it's not at the same time, but what, like, what does that mean? Like to go deeper, right? So it, it, it's to go deeper, you have to have emotional safety, which really enables us to feel free. It allows us to dream. It allows us to be very, very creative And it allows us to share bold ideas and really increase our capacity for compassion um, and to be able to express ourselves. So when we are able to freely express ourselves in our relationship, it is an ability that you have, it's, it's the relationship feeling emotionally safe. So if you don't feel free to emotionally express yourself, then mm-hmm. often that's usually a, uh, a position that we want to look at in the relationship. Well, what, 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 why does this not feel emotionally safe for you to be able to express your big, bold self? Um, And the latest research really around neurobiology shows that emotional safety is the most important aspect of a satisfying, loving, and connecting relationship. And when we look at, um, and many of you probably know Bene Brown, she talks about vulnerability and the real need to feel safe the need to feel safe before we're able to feel vulnerable. So if there's not safety in the relationship, then we won't have the vulnerability that is the juice and the intimacy of our relationship. So vulnerability being where love and joy and courage and empathy and accountability and authenticity, one of the your biggest values from what you shared, you talked about honesty, which is around the, it's similar to authenticity. 100%, 100%. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. It, and so in order for us to feel emotionally connected, even 1%, we need to feel safe. And we not only need to feel safe in our brain, in our bodies, but we also need to feel safe in our brains, but first our bodies, cause our body is always scanning for threat. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the work of, and I really also, when I'm, when I'm talking, I like to refer to the researchers so that this isn't my work, this is the researcher's work. And so I will always give uh, the name of the researcher because these guys do a lot, the guys, women and men do a lot of work. Um, so I want to honor, uh, honor them as I share with you. Uh, So Dr. Stephen Porges, and he's a scientist at the Indiana University, and he works around the poly, that his work is around polyvagal theory. And really that's observing the physiology of the autonomic nervous system. So what that means is your autonomic nervous system are the things that happen automatically in your body, like breathing and digestion. So what he also found is this determines our autonomic nervous system scans, and it determines if we're connected or we feel threatened. So mammals are very dependent and they gather cues from their significant other as to whether we're safe. So we're always gathering cues and that's where it comes from our body. Our body is always gathering cues as to whether we're safe or not. So I, yeah, jump in. I want to jump in for a second and I, and I, oh gosh, for the life of me, I can't remember her name, but she's this neurobiologist. I just recently came across her stuff. So hopefully I'll remember and I can post it in the, in uh, below the video Um, or I'll find it. 
but something that she was talking about, she works a lot with heart rate variability. Oh, yes. And, um, and she was saying, uh, so the interviewer was a podcast and they were like, they were talking about relationship and they were talking about safety and, you know, just various different things um, and resilience. And she was like, I would never, and like, she was really strong about this, sleep separately from my partner. And the reason was, she's like, even if it means that my sleep gets interrupted because she's, she's actually done the research with the heart rate variability what happens when you are co-sleeping and like she'll say okay my partner might wake me up and give me some kisses he's leaving he's going off to work or something she said the benefit of what that did even though it was a disruption to her sleep hugely outweighed the fact that it was a disruption to her sleep so anyway i just wanted to like interject that no, thank you. That's so, like, great. Really, at, so it was interesting because I know there's different schools of thought on this. Yeah, no, that's really yeah. important, Anna, because that's messaging and cueing of love. So we're always scanning, is this safe? Does this feel like love? Does the tone, do the facial expressions? So he was just displaying uh, cues of love. So that was very important for their self, not self, but their co-regulation as a couple. And we'll get into what co-regulation is, what Anna's talking about. It sounds like she needs that for her own well-being and her co-regulation um, as a couple. That's something that it sounds like is adamant for her. Um, yeah, so... So what we say and how we say things to our partner shifts our biology. That's why it's really important to be conscious of how you're talking and how you're communicating with your partner, because this is where we get stuck in what I call the perfect storm. Um, so last week I explained the three stages of relationships. So the perfect storm is when we start to trigger each other and we act out behaviors that trigger our partner and they act out behaviors and we get in this loop of destruction and it's really hard to break and shake. So the way that we get out of that is start to know that everything you say to your partner shifts your own biology on a physiological level. So if you react you are also shifting your own biology. That is the craziest and awesome thing at the same time that we have responsibility over our own physiology on how we re interact with our partners and the things that we say. So we really wanna become more aware of our triggers and take that pause before reacting because what we're really learning how to do is to create a safe presence with our partner in our life. So this requires us to both be aware of our own reactions and our body being able to have this reflexive action, but not actually go with that reflexive action, just honoring, oh, I'm having a triggering moment and also be sensitive to our partners because a lot of times what happens, uh, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when we react and are aware of our body is reacting, we have to stop. That is when we stop, when we notice our heart starting to race, our armpits starting to sweat, we want to react and say something back. That's when we really want to stop, take a moment, pause, um, because the only thing that's really going to come out is a reactive and defensive explanation. And when we stop and appreciate that our bodies are just having a reaction and we can start to have more compassion for ourselves and our bodies and our brains and kindness toward our partner, giving our partner the benefit of the doubt that we don't necessarily know where they're coming from unless we have a discussion with them, that we're able to then start to co-regulate. We can have this dance of acknowledging that we're triggered and acknowledging that there's an interaction happening, but not make a story up about the interaction. Because we're going to want to, if we don't have that paused moment, we're going to want to come up with a, a, a defensive explanation that often comes across as blaming our partner for something. So an example of that, do you get, do you get need an exp explanation? Would that be helpful here? Because this is real. Anna, do you feel like an explanation would be helpful here or yeah. is it? 
Okay. Oh, example. An example. Okay. So for instance, if I'm talking to you and we're in the middle of a conversation and you have all day been tolerating this, uh, this is actually a, a very good example that Dr. Steve uh, Porges has has given an example because when there's construction, like if you live in an apartment and there's constant construction going on and you hear that your body's already in a threat state. Mm -hmm. So you're already hyper, uh, oh, hyper vigilant. You're, you have an, a, a heightened, uh, a, a, a nervous system. And then your partner comes in. So you're tolerating the construction. So on a biological level, that's there. And your partner comes in, he says something to you and then he turns away. And all of a sudden that turning away represents to you for the times you don't feel heard, seen, felt by this person. And you want to react like, right? But you pause for a second and you're like, oh, I remember that time when I was young and like, I felt ignored because, you know, I had other brothers and sisters that were needing more, you know, needing the attention. And it just really because often our triggers are from, uh, they are from the past and we're having flashbacks. So then all of a sudden your partner's like, you say to your partner, oh my gosh, I just really felt so triggered. And I felt so alone in that moment when I was really trying to have this discussion with you about something important and you turned away. And he says, oh, you know, I actually turned away because I saw the pain in your face and it was making, it, I was feeling overwhelmed by it. So that there's mm -hmm. this, Discussion to be had that it wasn't personal it wasn't personal but it actually was our biology at play here mm -hmm. does that make sense definitely yeah yeah so, all subtle things too right those subtle things that we get so upset by right that can just irritate the heck out of us and we want to be able to hold that feeling that trigger in in a in time and 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 start to hold it long enough to come up with plausible explanations that it's something you might not know because if we have time to come up with plausible explanations um, cause if we, excuse me, I should word it this way. If we don't have time to come up with plausible explanations, all we do is blame. And then when we, we end up blaming, we hold the shame and the one that blames the most holds the most shame that mm. isn't enough to get his or her partner to change a behavior or change the way they're acting or behaving differently. So that's super important in being able to create emotional safety is to just take that pause, take that pause because then you can come up with plausible explanation. Um, I do wanna to touch upon uh, the benefits of emotional safety. We talked about some of them in the beginning, but just to recap, you know, we get a lot of strength when we feel safe. We can become more empowered when we feel safe. We have an opportunity to be more bold when we feel safe. So it allows for more deepening of spirituality even, or appreciation of aesthetics and deepening of um, our relationships because we feel safe. So I'm going to give you three skills to establish. Like healthier too. We're healthier. There's so more health in the body, vitality. Absolutely, Anna. Thank you. Absolutely. When we are in toxic relationships or toxic environments, if we don't know how to actually navigate them to elevate and grow through that, it will weigh on the body and you will end up often getting sick. Yeah. So three skills um, that you will want to develop in your relationships for emotional safety is one, co-regulation before self-regulation. Co-regulation is our ability to help each other regulate and calm each other down. So that can be cues from the face, the facial expressions. That can be our voice. So lower frequency voices are more threatening. That's why mothers and even um, mm -hmm. fathers will talk in a higher pitch to a child, right? Because it's, it's upbeat, it's lighter. Lower frequencies will be more threatening. And also the intentionality of the hands, 
right? Our hand movements, our brain is always scanning for threat. So it can spot threat threat before you even are able to process what is going on in that situation. So we want to be aware of these of the biology running under the psychology. It gives insight. So co-regulation is that ability to calm each other via our nervous systems um, and calm each other down. And that is often done through recognizing our partner's facial expressions, also their vocal tone. Those are the two, two mm -hmm. things that really mm -hmm. affect our nervous systems and our nervous system and to put our nervous systems on, on high alert. So we want to really look, did that make sense, Anna, in, in explaining, explaining? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just thinking, would body language also fall into that? Yeah, and I think that that's absolutely true when they talk about intentionality of the hands, right? Our that that is our body language and how we're communicating. So if I do this to you, already your brain, even before you process that, you're like, "What the heck? Why did you put your hand in front of my face?" Right? So already it's high alert, high alert. This is threatening. And why they say that, uh, so I, I guess I'll get to this with the co-regulation versus self-regulation. They have found that having more co uh, having good co-regulation leads to better self-regulation. Mm -hmm. So when we're able to co-regulate with our partners and protect each other and calm each other down, we're better able to have self-regulation. And self-regulation is our ability to really regulate our own behavior as well as it allows you to stay calm even when there's chaos around you. And thirdly, the skill is self-compassion. Can I be kind to myself in these moments of stress? This is a stressful interaction for my body and my brain. How can I be calm from, not calm, how can I be kind to myself? Taking what Dr. Kristen Neff calls is a self-compassion break, putting your hand in your heart, taking a couple deep breaths. That ties in to our ability to self-soothe. And the bigger muscles we have for self-soothing, the better able we are to stay self-regulated and deepen our self-compassion. So lastly, I'm gonna give you five. I said three, but I couldn't stop myself because there was five ways to amplify your emotional connection. And then we'll take uh, we'll take uh, some questions. I know Katerina has a question. So guys, couples that play together, stay together. Playing is essential because it mobilizes mm -hmm. our body. It creates social inner engagement and it also uses our voice all the things that create emotional safety. Um, when you look, even dogs and kids, they have to play. If couples play, they often are able to stay together. Also, when we play, our voice goes up. We have a higher pitch often, which again, creates safety. Uh, again, that taking that moment, that pause between trigger, between action, and reaction. So if something happened, the trigger happened, but we don't need to react so that we can start to have plausible explanations that there's more possibilities in that pause versus what you automatically jump to. And then the tone, remember the tone of our voice, lower frequencies are more triggering than higher frequencies in our voice. That doesn't mean going around talking in a high voice, but if we need to be more aware on how our partners also experience our tones um, and explaining without criticizing, right? So when we're able to explain something neutral, neutrally, it's less likely that you're going to feel unsafe in your relationship. And third, and the fifth one is managing third. Be, what I mean by third, this is the work of Dr. Stan Tacton. This is your cell phone, your family, your friends, everything outside the relationship that if not managed, threatens the relationship. So there has to be good management and understanding. I don't know if you've seen this uh, research on aware, even if the cell phone is on a dinner table turned down, it actually cuts the level of intimacy and conversation. I could see that. I could totally see that. I haven't seen the research, but I could <laughs> make sense. It, next time somebody's phone is out, just notice how deep you can go in conversation. 
Mm-hmm. It, it's interesting. I find every time I get caught up with the phone um, and just distracted by it. And people tend to pick it up more when it's on the table. Mm-hmm. So, okay, guys, that's a wrap for today. I want to take any questions. So this is your time to jump in. Um, okay. Yes. T- Katarina. Okay. So I'm going to go back on it. I'll just read uh, the chat. Um, Marina was saying she's quite analytical and detail oriented too. Uh, that may be coming from another aspect of her chart is that she is the one well, that Pisces moon. Oh, she was Pisces moon. Yeah. That may be coming from uh, it, totally. I mean, we're talking about the moon, but there's so much to your chart. <laughs> so much there, to your yeah. chart. Yeah, so it's really about getting a full analysis of how these different energies are influencing. Thanks for chiming in, Marina. Beautiful. Um, uh, Katerina, deep conversations, understanding, and playfulness. Is that, uh, Katerina, uh, feeling emotionally safe? I think that was the... Uh, yeah, I think those are the answers to your question. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm so glad she she jumped in. Yes, time is everything. She's also a quality time, a qu- quality time girl. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, Marina as well, quality time together and physical touch makes her feel loved and emotionally connected to her partner. Uh, I appreciate acknowledging the source of information. Sometimes I've noticed other coaches don't. Yeah, so she, Marina Marina actually has a background. She is, a, if you don't mind me sharing, is a therapist and also has a research background as well. And so she was just saying that she appreciates the acknowledgement to the researchers. Um, Katerina, uh, oh, that was question number two. Sorry, uh, what was question number two? Question number two, Katerina, was what makes you feel loved? Um, and I know we don't have much time, but Anna, do you know anything about the uh, Black uh, Willet? Black I, Lil- I have it in uh, my seventh house, Cancer. Yeah, I mean, Black Moon Lilith, just really quickly, is um, she she's basically, if I was going to synopsize, because she can get like this really like doom and gloom energy, but but she is really about feminine empowerment. So being in your seventh house in the sign of cancer, I'm like, whoa, she is like, girl, you've got to show up as the, the, the powerfully sensitive heart centered nurturer, or I'm going to cause you some, some little, I'm going to rattle your cage. She's there to be like, step up and be a powerful, you know, set like cancer's, cancer's, cancer's the female archetype. She's the mother archetype, whether you're a mother or not, it doesn't matter. I have a cancer rising. I don't have children, but I am a mother. I am a sacred space holder. I mother many and I mother my creativity. And so that's in that respect, that's very much in the context of particularly your one-on-one relationships. Hmm. Ah, she said, I'll, uh, so yeah, what we'll do, Katerina is she'll, she, she wants your information. So just jot it in the, in the chat. Okay. I will do that. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. So, uh, oh, my apologies. Marina says, no, I'm a Pisces sun and a Capricorn moon. Capricorn moons, I would imagine. Oh yeah. Analytical. Oh, for sure. Because they're like, they they are, they're, um, they're about structure. They're about order. It's different you know, there's a little different energy, certainly than Virgo, which we were talking about another earth sign, but, but, and also like authority and power and a bit of like control that can be, there can be a controllingness to the emotion. So Capricorn moon maybe tends towards controlling their emotions, Mm. keeping, keeping the face, keeping that, keeping the face, the public face, the public image. Mm. be. Thank Thank you. Uh, And then we had, oh, so recap, Jessica, uh, thanks for chiming in here. So good to have you with us. So Jessica says, how do I figure out my sun and my moon? If you go um, at the beginning of this, Jessica, I shared to go to astro.com, create a free account. And, um, and then you can go to extended chart selection and just create your birth chart. You put in your birth info. 
Um, that's how you can self do it. You probably won't be able to interpret everything unless you are, you know, have been doing a lot of study, but, but it'll give you, it'll give you your chart and then you'll see sun, moon, you'll see it all. You'll see everything will be listed there. And then that's, you know, what somebody like me uses when we go into the readings and we go into the interpretation and we talk about the energies, but that'll give you your chart astro.com. Perfect. All right. Any last questions or we're jumping off? Uh, go ahead and just shoot them in the chat. Uh, fabulous. Thank you so much for being with us. You guys brought up, you women brought up so many great, great questions. Thank you for being such A players and, and really engaging. We so Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you know, what a gift. And thank you all for being here. And thank you to everyone who's going to be watching this later. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, don't hesitate to type your questions in there and do, you know, and tag us or, you know, like, like, I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. So we can, <laughs> we can know that you have a question, whatever that is. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. Do it. Go ahead and tag us so we can immediately, it'll pop up so we can see that. Uh, uh, Katerina says, thank you, Danielle. Thank you for your time. Sending you all love. Thank you, Anna from Katerina. And then, um, Jessica also says, thank you. You guys are, you women are amazing. It's been so much fun. We will have our contact information in the chat so that you can reach out to either one of us. And uh, yeah, that's a wrap for today. Join us next week. We are back on our normal 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. Um, and we are talking about, what are we talking about, Anna? We're talking about communication. Ah, one of my favorite topics. Fantastic. So let's dive into communication and your astrology, as well as how to communicate and have three communication hacks that really turn a conversation around. All right. See you all later. Thanks so much, Anna. Thank you. Bye. Much love. Much love. <laughs>